Hello and welcome to the Abuse and Neglect Prevention, Critical Incident and Human Rights Annual Recertification Training. This module one that will help you understand and identify abuse and neglect. Training Overview. Be prepared to adjust the volume on your computer to listen to this training. To enable closed captioning, press the CC button on the bottom left or right of your video display screen. This learning path contains multiple components in the form of videos and quizzes. To be marked complete for this training, you must complete all modules and pass all quizzes, in addition to completing the final attestation form and mandatory reporter sign-off. Hello, and welcome to the Department of Developmental Services Abuse and Neglect Prevention Presentation. My name is Jordan Sheff, and I'm the Commissioner at the Department of Developmental Services. I'm joined today by one of our distinguished self-advocates, Carol Grabby. Hi, my name is Carol Grabby, and I'm the self-advocate coordinator in the South Region in the Wallingford office. We're so glad that you could join us today in this, in this presentation. You will learn of the different types of abuse and neglect, identifying symptoms, and how to complete a report. And you will also learn in this training about human rights and the importance of how to treat individuals with the respect and the dignity that they deserve. Please be sure to take notes throughout the presentation and ask any questions you might have. As a reminder, you are mandated reporters. Everyone, regardless of job classification, must take this training annually. Let's, Let's begin. begin. This training is one of the most important trainings for all GDS and private provider employees. There will be a lot of information covered today, including review and understand definitions and examples of abuse and neglect, including all types of abuse, physical by nature, verbal, psychological, sexual, and financial exploitation. Understand how to recognize and identify potential signs of abuse and neglect, including physical and behavioral signs to be aware of. Understand the role of a mandated reporter and the expectations in their position with DDS or a DDS qualified provider. Throughout this training, you will also be provided with some statistics of substantiated cases, an overview of your role as a mandated reporter. Before we dive in, a reminder that you are a mandated reporter. This is a requirement of your job at DDS for every person providing support to, in, to individuals funded by the department. Regardless of your title, you are a mandated reporter. That means reporting abuse or neglect 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just when you are at work. It also means you don't have to have proof. You may be a witness. You saw or heard it. Even if you suspect it, you should report it. And if you hear about it from someone else, you must report it. It is not an option to report suspected abuse and neglect. As a mandated reporter, your failure to report suspected abuse or neglect can be reported as neglect itself and may lead to progressive discipline. Any and all types of discipline may be considered depending on the severity of the abuse and neglect that was not reported. To elaborate on the general Connecticut General Statute 46A-11B, allegations should not be called in just because a supervisor tells an employee to do so or as a means of covering one's own best interest. There must be reasonable cause to suspect abuse or neglect on the part of the reporter. The reporter should be prepared to explain their reasonable cause to AID's central intake and other agencies as necessary as to why they think there was abuse and neglect. Reasonable cause is not to discourage people from calling if they suspect abuse or neglect taking place. If you witness or suspect abuse or neglect, the steps to take are stop it intervene and protect the victim, obtain any necessary medical treatment, support the victim, and then report and document. So 
So what does abuse mean? Here on this slide is the definition of abuse. Abuse is the willful infliction of physical pain or injury or the willful deprivation by a caregiver of services which are necessary to the person's health or safety. Abuse also includes financial exploitation, psychological abuse, sexual abuse, or verbal abuse. So what does willful mean? Willful means intentional acts or omissions or the reckless disregard for the safety and consequences of one's actions or omissions. So this slide shows the different types of abuse that could occur. We have physical by nature, sexual, verbal, psychological, and financial exploitation. Here on the screen are the allegations of abuse and neglect reported in the fiscal year 2022. As you can see, there were over 2,000 allegations of abuse and neglect last year. Of those 2,312 allegations, 1,016 cases were substantiated. That is 44% rate of substantiation. The list on the right hand side of the screen further breaks down how many allegations were reported for each type of abuse and neglect. You will also see on the screen how many of each type of abuse and neglect were substantiated. These statistics reflect the numbers for the state of Connecticut, public and private sector for people with intellectual and developmental dis disabilities. This information was provided by the Division of Investigation within DDS for the fiscal year 2022. Please note that an open case still being investigated is included in that allegation number. So what exactly is abuse that is physically physical by nature? There are many examples hitting, shoving, tripping, pushing, pulling, scratching, pinching, cutting, biting, or excessive physical or chemical restraint. Example of a chemical restraint is medically restricting or overuse of an individual's medication, preventing an individual from using his or her wheelchair, or taking away an individual's personal possession as a means of punishment. It is important to remember that one report can be substantiated for multiple forms of abuse. The third and fourth example on the screen is a great representation of one situation that could be substantiated as multiple forms of abuse or neglect. Preventing someone from using their wheelchair would be physical by nature, psychological abuse, and neglect. It is important to note that all allegations of abuse are considered neglect. Neglecting to provide safety and proper care for an individual we support would always be considered neglect. Some examples that someone has been abused physically could be human bite marks, cuts or scratches, symptoms of internal injury, bruising or swelling, punctures, burns, broken bones or fractures, and any injury of unknown origin. When evaluating if someone has been abused, it is important to consider behavioral changes that occur, could, could occur in addition to physical signs. Some examples of potential behavioral signs that could be signs of abuse are more emotional, nightmares and bedwetting, fearful of certain environments or certain people, self-injurious behavior. If this is a change from their baseline, self-injurious behavior could also be a potential physical sign as well. There could be crossover amongst behavioral and physical signs you observe in some situations. Past negative behaviors reappearing, nervousness, sleep disturbances, 
and any other changes in behavior that does not align with their baseline. Remember, when considering these behaviors, it is crucial that you take into consideration the individual's baseline. If changes in their baseline occur, the staff reference their logbook, discuss changes with the delegating nurse, and document the changes. When considering an individual's baseline, it is not the staff's job to determine if a story is fabricated. For example, if an individual tells you another staff has abused them, in good faith, you should report that regardless of the individual's behavior history. With that being said, staff should be aware of other causes for injuries and not automatically assume that their injuries are abuse. This is important information to assess before making a report of abuse. However, if abuse or neglect is suspected and reported, the individual needs to present reasonable cause when making the report. Location of the injury is important to consider. Some places on the body are more prone to accidental injury. Injuries do not mean that abuse has taken place. There should be documentation on the injury or the incident. If there is no documentation of the injury, then you should report it as abuse and neglect as injury of unknown origin. Common injuries can occur on the knees, elbows, shin, forehead, or the back of the head. Places on the body that are less common to have an injury from an accident, such as on the individual's back, their chest, their genitals, buttocks, upper thigh, abdomen, forearm. When considering placement of injury, it is important to consider the person's baseline and their behaviors or behavior plan, along with any documentation. Next, we are going to discuss sexual abuse. The definition of sexual abuse is any sexual contact or encouragement of sexual activity between an individual and a family member, employee or paid staff, legal representative or volunteer, regardless of consent. When looking at the definition of sexual abuse, it is important to remember that all humans are sexual beings, and most of the people we support are adults who have the right to make their own choices. However, as staff support, as staff support, as st as support staff to people with disabilities, it is important to encourage the individuals we support to build and understand healthy relationships. What we are talking about here is people who are supposed to be providing support and care, paid or volunteer staff, or family members taking advantage of a person they support would be considered sexual abuse. Some examples of sexual abuse are improper touching or groping of breasts, buttocks, or genitals, penetration, intercourse, or oral stimulation, caregiver forcing or pressuring an individual to take part in sexual acts, caregiver exposing themselves to an individual, inappropriate nudity, inappropriate exposure to sexual media or touching, forcing the individuals to watch pornography, encouraging or coaxing any sexual contact or sexually suggest, suggestive talks or remarks. Potential signs of sexual abuse could include difficulty sitting or walking, pain, swelling, or itching in the genital area, painful urination, vaginal discharge, injuries to the mouth, bruising or bleeding in the genital area, self-injurious behavior, any unusual changes in baseline behavior. 
With that being said, staff should be aware of other causes of injury or physical signs of sexual abuse. Staff should not automatically assume that these injuries are related to abuse. What is the person's baseline? This should be described in the person's programmatic plan. What does recent medical or behavioral documentation state for the individual? Is there a change or a deviation from their baseline that would indicate sexual abuse? For example, is there a lack of documentation for injuries to their genitals that could indicate sexual abuse? Is there a new medication the individual is on that could cause genital irritation or a rash? This is important information to assess before making a report of sexual abuse. Other potential signs of sexual abuse are sexual abuse could lead to medical conditions such as a UTI, a sexually transmitted disease, or an unwanted pregnancy. Any sign of a new medical condition or physical sign of sexual abuse should be reported to the delegating nurse or medical staff immediately. Medical staff will conduct the assessment and decide what the follow-up is needed. Like physical abuse, you may see behavioral signs in a person who is being sexually abused, even if there are no physical signs. Behavioral signs or indicators include unusual demands for attention or affection, promiscuity begins, or a new interest in sex, inability to sleep or wanting to sleep all the time, appetite disturbance, problems with personal boundaries, new psychiatric symptoms, and neglecting hygiene. Next, we are going to watch a short video about sexual abuse. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. Everyone is talking about how pervasive sexual abuse is in Hollywood, but there's an alarming and disturbing trend that no one seems to be talking about. That's assault against those who are more, more vulnerable, those with special needs and intellectual disabilities. According to a year-long NPR investigation, people with intellectual disabilities are sexually assaulted at a rate seven times higher than those without disabilities. Ariva, I know how passionate you are about this topic. Why do you think this hasn't been in the limelight? Just the way historically we've treated people with special needs in our country. If you think back to the early you know, 1920s and 30s, people, if you had an intellectual disability, you probably were forced to become sterilized. You were put in a hospital, you were sterilized, you were institutionalized. People with intellectual disabilities were thought to be subhuman. They weren't thought to be like you or me or the rest of the population, and they were treated that way. So when we're having this big discussion about the reckoning around sexual harassment and assault, Individuals with intellectual disabilities aren't even in the conversation. So I'm so glad that right here on The Doctors, we are having this conversation because it's such an important topic. And this is the most vulnerable population there is. They can't speak for themselves. They're not taking to Twitter or Facebook or sharing their stories the way we see a lot of the high-profile actresses doing. But it doesn't mean it's not happening in this community. And this study breaks that wide open. And now we have to do something about it. And it's a perfect storm for a predator, for somebody who, who wants to do that type of behavior that they're more likely to be able to get away with it. Well, they're preyed upon. 85% of the people that assault individuals with intellectual disabilities, it's because they know them. There's some yep. connection. It's a school teacher. It's a counselor. It's a relative, a friend, a neighbor, someone in the neighborhood. So this isn't happening to individuals by strangers. These are the people that are around them that hopefully are there to protect them and to be their advocates. But unfortunately, in many situations, are taking advantage so if we know the data that there is a seven times the increase in sexual assault if you have a disability in this scenario, what can you do to protect someone who maybe can't protect themselves? Yeah, a couple of things that are happening that I think are really positive. One is educating the parents. So there are centers all over this country that offer parent education because sometimes parents 
they don't know how to talk to their individual, their loved ones about sexuality, about feelings, uh, you know, normal feelings that someone with an intellectual disability will have around romance, around sex. So the parents need education. And also, and, and also knowing to use the proper terms. When yes. you're teaching your children, teach them vagina, teach them don't use code words for them, and teaching them about what's appropriate. And oftentimes we see people talking to a 50-year-old like you're talking to a five-year-old, mm -hmm. and that's not appropriate. So not only educating the parents, but the individuals themselves. They're training courses and classes where they can learn, and it's just a question of how do they learn. You may have to use uh, pictures, photographs. You may have to do interactive uh, techniques, but we can teach them to protect themselves, so to know what's school. a harmful relationship. Schools, community centers, group homes, uh, wherever intellectual disabled people live, where they work, where they are, they need to be protected. And we have an obligation. If we see something, say something. Is there someone who may be around our kids that you need, need to be looking out for? Yeah, I, I think, unfortunately, the profile is that person that's closest to you. So we often overlook the cousin, the uncle, and not to say that all cousins and right. uncles are predators, so I don't want to make that statement, but sometimes it's that person that's closest to that individual. Uh, and again, that person with a disability, they're not necessarily going to be able to articulate. They may think that someone abusing them is actually someone showing them affection because they're often ostracized and isolated and they're lonely and they want mm. any affection and they will misinterpret abuse for they may a not healthy even relationship. Interpret it as abuse, correct? They may not even interpret it. They may that, think it's a healthy why, relationship. And we have to be diligent as caregivers. We have to be diligent as parents, education, education, education. So again, I'm just so happy uh, that we at the doctors are making this a part of the conversation because these individuals, they deserve to be protected just like any other population. And if you want more resources on how you can protect the loved one or how to report a sexual assault, we'll have resources at thedoctorstv.com. So if you witness or suspect sexual abuse, it is important that sexual abuse is a crime and should be treated as such. The steps to take if you witness or suspect this type of abuse would be Stop the incident and protect the victim. Your primary role is to keep the individual you support safe and make sure to stop the incident and protect the victim. If the perpetrator would put you in danger if you stepped in and stopped the abuse from taking place, revert to other ways to stop the incident. For example, pull the fire alarm or set off a car alarm. Be supportive caring and gentle toward the victim. Do not disturb any physical evidence if possible. Encourage the victim not to perform any hygiene, such as taking a shower, a bath, changing clothes, or brushing their teeth until a medical evaluation has occurred. Do not ask why questions. Do not press for details or challenge the person. Remember, this is a victim. There are trained professionals to provide support to victims of sexual abuse. Notify your supervisor or manager on duty and then report to the appropriate agency or agencies. It is important to remember that if an individual self-reports a potential incident of sexual assault, you need to believe what the person says to be true. If the suspected abuse is not stopped, often the sexual predator will continue with this behavior pattern. As discussed in the video, remember that anyone could be a predator, and oftentimes for people with disabilities, it is the people closest to them. By following these steps, the agency will take every precaution to protect the victim and seek justice. The supervisory staff on duty will make sure the individual is safely transported to the emergency room and evaluated by a medical professional and should ensure the individual has extra clothing, adaptive equipment, and any other items for changing after medical evaluation. The supervising staff on duty will then notify the police and report and document. 
It is important to note that the supervisor's reporting process is not to call the reporting agency or agencies to make the initial report. They will guide the staff in ensuring the appropriate agency or agencies have been notified and the document documentation is complete. Lastly, the supervisor should engage with the victim's team to ensure they are connected with a trained sexual assault crisis center or counselor. Are you or someone you know a victim of sexual assault? If you need support, okay, you can see there's three phone numbers on, listed on this slide. The first two are the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Assault, and the one on the bottom is the National Sexual Assault Hotline. The next type of abuse we're going to discuss is psychological abuse. The definition of psychological abuse is an act that is likely to humiliate, intimidate, degrade, or demean an individual, inflict emotional harm, or invoke fear in such individual, or otherwise negatively impact the mental health of such individual. Every employee should be careful to avoid being psychologically abusive and be aware of and alert to others doing these kinds of abusive behaviors. Things such as promising something to an individual with no intention to follow through, telling an individual that they are receiving services because no one loves them or wants them, discarding or hiding an item that is important to the individual, this could also be willful deprivation of services. Talking about or mimicking individuals in front of them. Taking away an individual's personal possessions as a means of punishment. This would be abusive and willful deprivation of services. Discarding or hiding an item that is important to the individual. This could also be willful deprivation of services. Excessive volume of TVs or radios in a home or in a vehicle to drown the person out or irritate them. Overall, it is important to remember that as employees supporting individuals, we should remember to be respectful. Treat the individuals how they want to be treated. The next section of this training that is important to discuss is financial exploitation. Financial exploitation is the theft, misappropriation, or the unauthorized or improper use of property, money, or other resource that is intended to be used by or for an individual who receives funding or services from the department. Some examples of financial exploitation are borrowing or stealing money from an individual. Having an individual pay for food, gas, items, or admission fees for staff without team approval. Selling personal items to individuals, such as computers, TVs, furniture, cell phones. Trading cash for less than the full value of a gift card or a gift certificate. Taking food or supplies from an individual's home. Some additional examples of financial exploitation are gaining an individual's money by threat, persuasion, or exploitation, stealing or misusing an individual's money or possessions, taking of cash, valuables, medications, or other personal property, self-directed support staff putting in for hours not worked. This would also go along with falsifying your timesheet. Financial exploitation also includes using one's, one individual's money to pay for things for other individuals, preventing or limiting access to an individual's available funds or spending, using or opening bank accounts, ATMs, or credit cards in the name of an individual, 
staff using individuals COVID funds for personal use, mismanagement of an individual's finance accounts or benefits. The last type of abuse to discuss is verbal abuse. Verbal abuse is the use of offensive or intimidating language that provokes or causes the distress of an individual with intellectual disability or a person who receives services from the Department of Social Services Division of Autism Spectrum Disorder Services. Examples of verbal abuse are swearing or yelling, or using profanity toward or around an individual, derogatory language which humiliates or ridicules an individual, language which intentionally provokes or upsets an individual, yelling, extreme voice volume, or multimedia volume so the individual cannot be heard. Some additional examples of verbal abuse are mimicking or name calling toward an individual, inappropriate teasing or taunting towards an individual, staff arguing with one another in front of the individuals when it causes agitation for the individual. Next, we will discuss neglect. Neglect is the failure by a caregiver, including Department of Developmental Services staff, DDS qualified provider staff, and CCH licensing in cases of programmatic neglect through action or inaction to provide an individual with the services necessary to maintain such individuals physical health, mental health and safety. Neglect also means a situation where an individual either is living alone and is not able to obtain the services that are necessary to maintain physical or mental health or is receiving such necessary services from a caregiver. When talking about neglect, it is important to remember that neglect may not be willful, which we had discussed with abuse. When there is a report of injury of unknown origin, for example, a fall that resulted in a bruised knee, but was not documented and reported correctly by the staff, or the staff was not providing correct supervision, these types of allegations oftentimes result in a substantiated neglect case. As a mandated reporter, your failure to report suspected abuse or neglect can be re reported as neglect itself and may lead to progressive discipline. Some examples of neglect, failure to seek or delay in seeking medical treatment when necessary or failure to keep adequate supply of medications in stock for the individual. Failure to follow an individual's food consistency or nutritional dietary requirements. Failure to intervene when two individuals are physically fighting. Failure to intervene when an individual engages in self-injury. Some additional examples of neglect are failure to intervene or report abuse or neglect, failure to appropriately perform CPR when necessary, failure to provide adequate levels of supervision for an individual as required, and failure to follow an individual's behavior support plan. Remember, you are a mandated reporter. This is a requirement of your job at DDS. And for every person providing support to individuals funded by the department, regardless of your title, you are a mandated reporter. That means reporting abuse or neglect 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just when you are at work. It also means you don't have to have proof. You may be a witness. You saw it or heard it, even if you suspect it, you should report it. And if you hear about it from someone else, you must report it. It is not an option to report suspected abuse and neglect. 
as a mandated reporter, your failure to report suspected abuse or neglect can be reported as neglect itself and may lead to progressive discipline. Any and all types of discipline may be considered depending on the severity of the abuse and neglect that was not reported. To elaborate on the G Connecticut General Statute 46A-11B, allegations should not be called in just because a supervisor tells an employee to do so or as a means of covering one's own best interest. There must be reasonable cause to suspect abuse or neglect on the part of the reporter. The reporter should be prepared to explain their reasonable cause to AID central intake and other agencies as necessary as to why they think there was abuse and neglect. Reasonable cause is not to discourage people from calling if they suspect abuse or neglect taking place. It is now time to take your module one quiz. You must receive 100% on the quiz in order to move on to module two of this training. If you have any questions, please contact the training division at DDS or a training representative at your agency for additional training or for additional information. This training is the property of the Connecticut Department of Developmental Services and should be used for training purposes only. This material should not be sold or used for profit. Thank you for your time today. If you have any follow-up questions, direct the employees to email dds.training at ct.gov.